1965, it was a time a lot like now, which students have described as mighty times, and I agree, it was mighty times, and we have mighty times again today. By 1965, at Christmas time, the U.S. Congress had voted almost unanimously to start escalating the Vietnam after the Gulf of Tonkin uh, incident. And so by then, we were seeing on the news these horrendous uh, images of bombing of houses, houses on fire, cuts on fire, children running from their burning huts, all of those famous images. And so the protest itself in December 65 then was, it was aimed at the Vietnam War. Yes, the first national protest against the war happened that Christmas, well, that November of 1965 in Washington, D.C. And my mother went along with my brother John and also Chris Eckhart, who later became one of the plaintiffs, and his mother were there. And on the way home, they were talking about what could be done in Des Moines to speak up about the war. And the idea of black armbands was raised, we think, by a man named Herbert Hoover, who was a Quaker and a distant relative of President Herbert Hoover, who said, what about black armbands? After the children were murdered by the Ku Klux Klan in 1963 in Birmingham, James Baldwin put out a letter calling for everyone to wear black armbands and to have memorial services around the country. And so in Des Moines, there was a memorial service, and uh, some in our family attended. I don't think I attended, but we do have photos from that with uh, Chris Eckhart's <coughs> father speaking and wearing a black armband. So the idea of the black armbands had been around, and of course it goes way back in history as a symbol of mourning. So you and your brother and Chris Eckhart decided to wear black armbands to school and even though the principals met and said you would be suspended if you wore the black armbands to school, you were 13 years old? I was 13 years old in eighth grade at Harding Middle School and I'm really excited to be going back there in February on the very day of the ruling to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the ruling, but there was a small group of students mostly high school students at Roosevelt High School who made the plan to wear black armbands to mourn the dead in Vietnam, and number two, to support a Christmas truce that was being called for by Senator Robert Kennedy. That was our message. It must have taken a certain amount of courage to do this knowing that you were going to be suspended. I mean, by the time you went to school that next day wearing the armband, the principals had announced that you would be suspended if you wore the armband. Well, as I like to tell students, it took a little bit of courage, and that's how much I had. I was a very, very shy girl, uh, one of the youngest in the family, and I had, but I had these examples of other kids who had spoken up and stood up, and then I had my parents' example. And so I like to tell kids, it only takes a little bit of courage, uh, and you can find that and do something. You may be surprised at how much of an effect you can have, even with your little bit of courage. Because when I got to school and was sent to the office and told to take off my armband, I looked around the office and I looked at Mr. Willitson and I said, okay, and I took off that armband. After we wore the black armbands to school and got suspended, my brother got suspended the next day. Five students got suspended. And then People started sending us hate mail. Um, we got a lady called me on the phone and said, is this Mary Beth? And I said, yes. And she said, I'm going to kill you. And I was so surprised and perplexed by all of that. People threw red paint at our house. Um, they threatened to bomb our house on Christmas Eve. It was really shocking and surprising to me in a way because we were speaking up for peace at Christmas time. And, you know, as a kid, I thought, that's what you're supposed to do. That's what we've been... Supposed to fit with the holiday. Yeah. So let's fast forward the three years to, to February 1969, and you learn about the Supreme Court ruling in your favor. What, what did that mean to you? How did you learn about it, and what, what did I, you understand about it? When I learned about the victory at the Supreme Court, I was a junior in high school, and by this time we had moved to St. Louis which was a big city to me, and I was just getting used to my new school. We had moved there in November, right before the oral arguments, and I was very shy, so I was really preoccupied with kind of adolescent issues. Who am I gonna to speak to in class, and what am I gonna do for lunch, and things like that. So uh, I was really surprised, though, when we won the case, because we had lost at the district level, we lost at the appeals level, 
And, you know, I thought no big important Supreme Court judge is going to say kids have rights or that we were right to break the rule in school and wear our black armaments to school. So I was really surprised. But as I've gotten to know First Amendment experts and lawyers through the years, I've realized that because of the climate and who was on the court, it really wasn't a big surprise to a lot of people. Like our lawyer, for example, we had a wonderful lawyer named Dan Johnston with the ACLU. He was right out of law school, and he was really great because not only was he a great lawyer, but he was very comforting to us kids, and we needed some of that at that time because of these you know, hostile people that were threatening and attacking us. Thinking back on it, I've been kind of surprised that the social studies teacher or the English, somebody didn't say, hey, everybody, something kind of interesting happened to Mary Beth yesterday. It was really a teaching moment, but... And that didn't happen. Not that I remember, but... I think a lot of teachers and administrators were also thrown off guard a little bit and they were they didn't know how to respond exactly because it, it really shook up the power dynamics. I remember Time Magazine wanted, they came to my chemistry class and it was really, I mean I was mostly just embarrassed and wanted to sort of hide but I, and I felt that way for some years actually. I was really shy and I didn't know what to do, how to deal with all of this. But later, I went to work as a nurse. I became a nurse and a nurse practitioner, and I worked mostly with kids and teenagers. And I started to see how they do not get a fair deal in our society, and they're not the highest priority. And so I thought, maybe I could tell them some of my experience and encourage them to stand up and speak up for themselves also. You know, so slowly over the years, I, I realized uh, the, the importance of the case and how it's still important today. And yes, it's been shipped away and it's been weakened by the three Supreme Court cases, especially on free speech for students that came after it, Frazier, Hazelwood, and the infamous Bong Hits for Jesus case. But basically the ruling, the meaning of the ruling remains that students do have free speech rights in school and that their humanity and their views and their input should be respected. And, and let's talk about what you think is the current state of student rights in school. It's very heartening to see how students are speaking up and standing up for their own interests. And of course, that's always been the importance of the First Amendment. Groups that did not get a fair deal or that were left out of our democracy needed the First Amendment to speak up and say, wait a minute, we should be included as well. And I think that's what young people are doing now. When you look at Black Lives Matter or the uh, March for Our Lives, the students in Florida, I mean, every three hours on average, a young person is killed by gunfire in the United States. And I've been a trauma nurse with teenagers. The ones that survive would be my patients. So I am very heartened to see how young people are speaking up and standing up for themselves. They are the most likely age group to live in poverty. They're affected by housing policy, climate policy. I mean, we've got now, I think 10,000 kids in Flint, Michigan were poisoned by lead in the water because of policies made that the kids themselves, the young people themselves, had absolutely no say in. And are you seeing this? I know you travel a fair amount, not just in this 50th anniversary year, but, but pretty constantly. Are you seeing this all over the country? Yes, there are so many things going on all over the country, whether it's in Kansas, small towns, uh, the journalism programs, figuring out how to deal with racism, racist incidents that have happened in their schools. I was just talking to some students there. Um, students in um, you know Minnesota are standing and speaking up about the climate. There are students in the West that are speaking up about the, the climate is a huge deal. And you know then there are issues like dress codes in school. And I always encourage kids, hey, if you feel like you should be able to wear yoga pants in school and you want to make that your issue, go for it because you know that's how they learn to to use their rights and speak up. And then that can be applied to other issues as well. But there are so many things that are that are going on with kids. A girl in Arizona wanted to wear a Black Lives Matter shirt to school. And the school boards association um, there worked with the principal who had tried to stop her. And the lawyers, you know, encouraged the principal to learn about the rights of students. And, and so she was able to wear her, her shirt to school in the end. But uh, I spent a lot of time now talking also to administrators and school boards and school board lawyers organizations. and. And I find that so many lawyers for school boards are, you know, interested in, in um, wanting 
to encourage kids to use their rights in ways that are, you know, responsible and, and that are within the law. What do you think lawyers can do? What's the role of lawyers in, in, in the fight over student rights? I meet so many lawyers like you, Steve, who have spent a lot of time and a lot of their lives, you know, encouraging young people and going into the schools or other venues to teach students basic civics, number one, to teach them the First Amendment, and to teach them how they can use their rights uh, and also responsibly. There is that, that issue to get involved, to testify at the city council, testify, um, you know, at the state legislature. Um, students in Florida, they went to the state legislature immediately after the 17 students were shot and killed their last year. Um, so lawyers can go into the schools, and I meet mean, many who do, and they can also, um, you know, learn about youth issues. Someone told me many years ago, whatever each of us does in our lives, we should also do something to promote young people's well-being. And I think all of us can follow that advice. But lawyers can also go to TinkerTourUSA.org right now and see all of the events that we have in the works for celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Tinker Ruling, which is coming up late February.